half a century, half a century ago, ago, Korea, Korea was, was one of the, one world's, of the world's, world's poorest, poorest countries. countries. A ray of shawn in 1971, when Kaist, when Kaist was established, established with six million dollars in aid. In aid. Now we no longer suffer from devastation and poverty. This is because Korea has transformed immensely since KAIST's founding. KAIST's mission was to lead Korea's industrialization. And it did so by advancing science and technology. KAIST was built on A. But now it is the benchmark of universities across the globe. A new era of uncertainty begins with the fourth industrial revolution. And with it, KAIST has a new mission. KAIST envisions to grow beyond Korea and become a global leader. As futurist Thomas Frey said, the present does not make the future. A vision of the future makes the present. KAIST seeks innovations in education, research, technology commercialization, globalization, and future strategy. It will instill the spirits of challenge, creativity, and caring in its students by creating world-class academic, technological, economic, and social value. KAIST will achieve its mission of becoming a global leader. Global Value, creating leading university, KAIST. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to KAIST Summit for its 50th anniversary celebration. My name is Park kyung -yeol. I'm a faculty member at Graduate School of Science and Technology Policy here in KAIST. I'll be your moderator for this summit. We are coming to you from KAIST main campus, Daejeon, Korea, and streaming live on YouTube. Before we begin, I'd like to note that this event is conducted under the health and safety protocols suggested by the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency. Over the past year, we have faced massive challenges. We all have enormous respect for the frontline workers battling the spread of the pandemic. We have been preparing for this summit within this context of the difficult times that we are overcoming together. That actually uh, lays foundation for today's discussion about some of the best practices and innovation in the world-leading universities. So I'm sure that today's summit will be a very timely discussion with the theme of roles and responsibilities of the university in a global crisis. So I'm really excited to meet our uh, tremendous speakers and discuss this very important issue today. So without further delay, let's begin the KAIST Summit. So welcome back. Uh, in the next 45 minutes, uh, we're going to have a keynote session. Uh, we have our uh, wonderful group of distinguished speakers who need a very little uh, introduction. So first, uh, MIT President um, Rafael Reif, and President Katsuya Masu from Tokyo Institute of Technology, and President Morton Shapiro from Northwestern University. And KAIST President Song Chul Shin. Thank you very much for your time and uh, participation. Um, we're going to hear from uh, each of the speakers for 10 minutes uh, and a 30 minute panel discussion and 20 minute uh, QA session will follow the keynotes. Um, before we get started, uh, I also wanted to mention our wonderful uh, group of uh, online participants here. Um, through this video streaming around the world, we are joined by 
students, uh, faculties, staffs, and alumni and valued friends of the university. So um, I can see you here. So thank you very much for your participation. So please wave your hands. Thank you very much, and say hi to all. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. Okay, so we'll be taking your questions uh, via YouTube. Um, so please use the um, comment box uh, next to the live streams uh, and to leave your name um, and ask interesting uh, questions. Okay. And uh, we know that um, uh, there are some people who are joining uh, this summit uh, on YouTube. Um, we are tremendously uh, excited to have you today. So we can't actually see you, but we can feel you, uh, uh, your presence and hopefully uh, hear your questions and uh, comments uh, as well. Okay. All right. Uh, very excited. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, President Raphael Reif, the 17th uh, president of MIT. Uh, president Reif is a champion for both fundamental science and also uh, multidisciplinary research. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. In MIT, he's been pursuing an aggressive agenda to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. We're really excited to have you here today, President Raphael Reif. Thank you, Professor Park. Thank you for your kind introduction. Thank it you very much. It is a true honor for me to be with all of you and to join today's panelists. And a special thank you to President Xin for inviting me to be part of such an important event. I'm delighted to wish guys a very happy 50th anniversary. MIT celebrated its 50th in 1911. It was an incredible moment of hope and promise in our history. MIT came into being at the time of the American Civil War with just 10 faculty members. 50 years later, it was the largest institution of its kind in the US. Now KAIST stands at its 50 year milestone, looking toward exciting new frontiers. You have all the world before you and many paths to explore as you grow, evolve and carry out your mission. As I think about the future of KAIST, I reflect on the fact that universities have a distinctive responsibility to serve humanity. Unlike many other institutions in society, even as we prepare our students for their immediate futures, universities have a unique capacity to focus on the long term. Technical universities are also places where innovation and entrepreneurship thrive. And because we connect talented people and focus them together on important problems, the members of effective together than they would be alone. I envision three vital roles for technical universities, as symbolized by three things an olive tree, an engine, and a baseball team. And I hope that by the end of my remarks, this will make some sense. We all know that in addition to developing the strength of our students, universities also cultivate knowledge itself. And that includes fundamental research, curiosity-driven research focused on advancing knowledge rather than producing immediate practical applications. At institutions like KAIST and MIT, the science and technologies we work on are incredibly complex, and they can be very hard to explain. But when I talk to members of the general public, nothing seems to be more difficult to explain than the importance of fundamental research. In effect, people say, should you focus on something more useful? But of course, in the long run, fundamental research may be the most useful thing we do. Now, here is the olive tree. If you plant an olive, 
you can grow an olive tree in a relatively short time. But for that olive tree to bear fruit, it can take years, even decades. For a long time, it is just a beautiful tree. And that may seem pretty useless. And yet there is simply no other way to get olives. At places like KAIST and MIT, we cultivate research as carefully as one tends an olive tree. And in the long run, the fruits of our efforts are breakthroughs in science and engineering with the potential to benefit humanity. Let me share a timely example. Countries around the world are now dealing with many obstacles to a rapid rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. But of course, the fact that we have a vaccine at all, actually multiple effective vaccines, and in record time, is a classic triumph of fundamental research. One of the vaccines being used in the US is from Moderna, a company with headquarters just steps from MIT. Like the other firms that develop successful vaccines, Moderna has quickly become a household name. To the general public, its mRNA vaccine appeared to be an overnight success. But of course, it was in fact the fruit of decades of careful, deliberate, curiosity-driven research. The Moderna vaccine can trace its roots back to the 1970s and an MIT professor named Phil Sharp. Later, he would go on to receive the Nobel Prize, but at the time, a leading member of MIT Center for Cancer Research. Professor Sharp and his fundamental research team discovered RNA splicing and revealed the potential of mRNA. Right away, researchers saw that mRNA could be used to make vaccines, but producing one that was both effective and safe proved extremely difficult. Over time, most people just gave up. But researchers who believed in mRNA's potential persevered. They overcame one obstacle after another, including the risk that a vaccine would trigger a dangerous immune response. A solution to that problem was found in 2005 by scientists at the University of Pennsylvania. Eventually, after decades of research, the technology arrived at a point where vaccines could be created and tested for diseases like influenza and the Zika virus. So when COVID-19 happened, companies like Moderna were ready. With the genetic sequence of the virus made publicly available by scientists in China, it took two days for Moderna to create a vaccine that is 94.5% effective. Only two days. But remember the olive tree. More than four decades of research went into building the platform for this incredible achievement. The current pandemic has made us painfully aware that we can never know what lies around the corner. But I'm convinced that a powerful way to prepare for the unknown is to support fundamental research, even when we're not equipped to see what practical good it may yield. Now to my second proposal for how today's technical universities can best serve society. In academic labs around the world, brilliant minds are at work on innovative ideas that do have practical applications with obvious potential to benefit humanity. But some of the best ideas never make it to the marketplace. Some never make it out of the lab. These are what we call tough tech innovations, highly complex, slow to develop, and expensive. In 2016, MIT created an engine to help tough tech startup companies move forward. Instead of converting energy into motion, our engine converts bold ideas into marketable technologies. We call this new organization the engine. The engine is located just a few blocks from our campus, and it has already supported stage startups working on solutions to difficult, important problems for society. 
Most of the startups are led by researchers from Boston area universities, including MIT. The engine helps sustain and accelerate their progress by connecting them to long-term capital, specific expertise, specialized equipment and labs, and a network of like-minded entrepreneurs. One startup is developing fast, accurate COVID-19 tests. Another is working on new software to make public transportation more reliable and efficient. And still another is committed to enabling safe, unlimited carbon-free power through nuclear fusion in 10 to 15 years. From our own experience and from observing similar projects at other institutions, we know that universities have the ability to help move the best ideas rapidly from concept to impact. And I believe we have a responsibility to do so in order to help deliver the greatest benefits to society. Finally, there is a third way for technical universities to serve the greater good by using our convening power to invite leaders from different sectors to work together toward a common goal. This is not much different from building a winning baseball team. In baseball, managers and coaches seek to attract players with different strengths and then motivate them to work together for the win. In the same way, universities often are able to convene leaders from industry to government and help them combine their strengths and collaborate to drive rapid and meaningful change. Universities like MIT and KAIST are playing for high stakes, like the sustainability of our civilization in the face of climate change. So let me offer a brand new example. To build a team to help accelerate progress against climate change, last week we launched the MIT Climate and Sustainability Consortium. The consortium is made up of companies from a range of industry sectors, construction to mining, transportation to textiles, real estate to pharmaceuticals. They have substantial carbon footprints and extensive supply chains, and they are highly motivated to work with MIT and with each other to pilot and deploy the solutions necessary to reach their own aggressive decarbonizing commitments. Our goal is to build a cross-sector baseball team that can vastly accelerate the implementation of large-scale, impactful solutions across many sectors in order to help meet the global climate emergency and do so in time to make a meaningful difference. The global crisis we face today are so complex and so urgent that we must address them from every possible angle. As universities continue to plant the olive trees of fundamental research, keep the engine of innovation running and unite and inspire committed global teams to solve the hardest challenges. I'm confident that we can play a decisive role in creating a better, more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech, President Reif. Um, I really like the metaphor, um, olive tree for uh, fundamental research and engines um, for innovative um, um, uh, collaboration with other uh, industries, and also baseball team for sort of good governance. So we'd like to hear more from you uh, in the uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, President uh, Kasuya Masu uh, of the Tokyo Institute of Technology, who has been leading scholar in the field of uh, electrical engineering. He became president of his alma mater in 2018. Uh, his leadership has recently guided uh, Tokyo Tech during a time of important transformation, uniting their uh, diverse research centers, labs, and units. Uh, previously, President Masu also served 
as the very first director general of the Institute of Innovative Research and Tokyo Institute of Technology. So, hi, President Masu. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be a very interesting insight from your speech uh, titled uh, Designing Our Future, uh, Tokyo Tech D-Labs Approach. So okay. please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to congratulate President Sin and all members of KAIST on your institute's 50th anniversary. It's very a uh, pleasure to join you today for the KAIST Summit. Uh, we saw drastic change of our, of our lives in the last year. Okay, so now uh, let's start my presentation using slides. So I will share my slides. Okay, can you see uh, my slides? Okay. Uh, in these times of uncertainty, I believe that is more important than ever for universities to lead dialogue with society and to share a vision of the future. Today, I would like to discuss our institute's effort to communicate and collaborate with the public through the activities of Tokyo Tech's Laboratory for Design of uh, uh, Design of uh, uh, Social Innovation in Global Networks or DLA. Okay. We established this DLA in September 2018 to serve as a platform. We are members of our community and the people with various backgrounds can openly brainstorm, discuss, and design the future together. Since its establishment, DIRA has hosted numerous workshops on the theme, A Future We Want. These events are aimed to bring the Tokyo Tech community, students, faculty, and staff members, and alumni together with participants from industry, the governments, and academia, and even high school students. I myself participated in most of the workshops. The open and friendly atmosphere of the workshop led to the interactive and vibrant uh, discussion on the future we truly want to create. Let me explain the backgrounds of DIRA. Contributing to society by creating innovation has been Tokyo Tech's philosophy and mission since our institute was founded in 1881. We believe the functions of the universities as drivers of innovation are first advancing science and technology, producing human resources, and communicating and collaborating with society. DIRA activities are features to promote, promote more inclusive and interactive dialogue between Tokyo Tech and the public. In addition, uh, DIRA aims to share a vision for a future we all want, rather than a future other university thinks it should be. I will elaborate on this concept. DRAB approach uh, to designing our future uh, involves looking backwards from the future to the present. Rather than forecasting the future based on trends in technology and seeking solutions to challenges that society could face. It starts by envisioning a future we all want. We do this by taking into account current issues as well as existing and emerging science and technology. 
once we clarify what the better future could like, we work backward from that images, considering the steps necess necessary to realize desired outcomes. Through this process, we can identify and propose new research, not only in science and technology fields, but also in social science and the humanities. This approach is referred as backcasting, as some of you may know. The backcasting process also involves identifying challenges to be overcome and prioritizing steps towards the realization of the goals. The past workshop, participants try to avoid simply extending linear thinking. Instead, they sought the intersection between the future we want and possibilities for new research and business concept. The discussion and ideas were refined and conceptualized in the form of 24 future scenarios, that is Tokyo Tech Future Chronology. Each future scenario describes a future we want in the context of our daily lives. The United Nations well-known Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, define actions we should take to achieve the goals by the target year of 2030. In contrast, DIRA uh, proposes what we can do for the future we want from a freer and broader point of view. The future chronology currently embraces a time span of 2030 to 2200. It will be modified as necessary. Each future scenario consists of future main elements listed in the left. As an example, let's look at scenario number two. Scenario number two depicts a future where personal health is automatically maintained. In this scenario, each person's physical condition is non-invasively monitored and data are shared with medical institutions. Then they, uh, we receive the proposals of their next meal, exercise, and so on. For example, as one of the first steps of technological challenges, some Tokyo Tech researchers who developed ultra high sensitive inertial sensors have collaborated with medical doctors on early diagon diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Thus, uh, each future scenario is described so as to bring out how research is connected to a desired future and to highlight what may be necessary to realize the future. Scenario number eight envisions a family life in the year of 2040, when everything we do in our daily lives can be done at home, with increases in and enhancement of time spent at home, the law and the functions of the family as a decision-making unit are strengthened. Considering recent social distancing measures and recent trends in work from home, it can be said, some aspects of this scenario have come 20 years earlier than we expected. Dira envisioned this scenario in the spring of 2019. Who could have imagined at the time that our lives would be significantly impacted by COVID-19 and people around the world would be re required to stay home? As I close my presentation, I would like to 
reiterate the importance of universities as drivers of innovation. In many conventional industry university collaborations, companies and universities have been tackled immediate scientific and technological problems. We have to recognize the structural change of conventional approach. Now, universities have to step, step up their efforts to map out a positive future and express how their knowledge and technology can guide society to the future. I believe these efforts promote opportunities for seeds of innovation to be planned and grow, it, grow in society. We are still experiencing unpredictable times due to the pandemic, but Tokyo Tech remains committed to creating a better future through dialogue with society. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Masu. Um, I was very interested in to learn about um, Tokyo Tech's D-Lab, especially um, kind of the dynamic modeling for technological forecasting and backcasting. Uh, on this 50 years uh, anniversary, uh, KAIST is also looking forward to our visions uh, for the future. So I'll be very happy to hear more of your thoughts uh, later on uh, during the panel discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Now we'll now hear from um, President Morton Shapiro of Northwestern University, uh, which he has led since uh, 2009. Um, previously, he was also a president of Williams College for 10 years. Uh, he's also uh, among the United States leading authorities on the economics of higher education and college financing. And also, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Education. He's about to publish his 10th book, Minds Wide Shut, How the New Fundamentalism Divide Us. So thank you very much for your participation today. Prince Shapiro, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you for that very warm and uh, really encouraging introduction. I will try not to disappoint you. I, I am going to take advantage of coming after two of my uh, favorite presidents in the global educational system. And I learned from what you said, and I'm going to take, take up briefly a few comments based on what I just learned from you. But before I say that, I also want to congratulate KAIST on its 50th anniversary. I love the opening montage to see the original building back in 1971. And, you know, you. boy, mm -hmm. it takes so many years to build a world-class research university. And that you did it in 50 years is, I mean, that's so Korea, right? I mean, that's the Korean miracle. I, I've been blessed to have a sort of a front row seat, if you will. I, I first started attending, a, coming to Korea back in 1989 when I gave a series of lectures at the Central Bank. And even though I'm a microeconomist and everybody in the audience was a money and banking macroeconomist, and they knew so much more about the subject than I. Uh, they nonetheless were very uh, humble and very gracious and very encouraging, even though uh, they weren't my best talks that I've ever given. I hope this one turns out to be a little better than those. And subsequent to that, I've continued to come on a regular basis. So I feel that over 32 years, I've gotten to witness some of the Korean miracle firsthand. Uh, President Shin, when you were at my office a year and a half ago, I'll get to that in a second, you might remember that like most educational leaders, we have all those pictures on our desk. And I'm sure, Rafi, you, you have that. And, and my esteemed colleague from Tokyo Tech and President, who all the luminaries and you're smiling, you have all those pictures. Well, one of the proudest pictures I have is a large picture on my desk of me with Kim Dae-young in the Blue House. Uh, uh, and uh, not only was it one of the highlights ever of my trips to Korea, it was one of the highlights of my professional life, being in the Blue House with that great luminary. And uh, so I love Korea, and I'm glad I do, because Northwestern, just like the other two uh, wonderful global institutions reflected here today, we have a lot of alums in Korea. And my favorite one is none other than President Shin. 
who himself is a PhD uh, engineering physics alum of ours, and I had the great honor to uh, award him one of our distinguished alumni achievement awards just a year and a half ago. So Korea is near and dear to my heart. So what can I say about the university and the new normal, which is my topic? Uh, let me again build on what I learned. Uh, I think interdisciplinary research is really important. When you, as we just heard, when you think about the, the big issues going forward, whether it's the pandemic or it's a growth in uh, income and wealth inequality over the last 40 years, or whether it's climate change, you know, they really demand an interdisciplinary approach. And I, I love this idea that you need basic science and you need translational science and you need other kinds of science, like social science, we would all add. And I, and I think that's a lesson in the new normal when it finally comes. Uh, I love disciplines, economics professor, 42 years. I'm very proud of my field. It's a great field. But sometimes I remind people that departments can be compartments as well, with a compartment as a barrier dividing one discipline from another. And you're not going to solve COVID-19 and you're not going to solve the great global problems uh, unless you are willing to bite the bullet and break down disciplinary boundaries. And I think that's a lesson in the new normal. And, you know, when I think about the work being done on my campus, and yeah, we're doing basic research on vaccines, we're doing translational, helping them bring, working with Abbott and everybody else, just as we heard from MIT, working with Moderna. Thank you, President Reif. I got my Moderna shot just last week. I'm waiting for the second one coming up. And I'm well aware that without MIT and, and friends, uh, we wouldn't have that miracle. But I also want to remind people that, you know, at least in this country, now Korea is a lot more rational than the United States, but at least in this country, there is a lot of resistance to getting the vaccine, particularly in certain pockets of communities in the United States. The communities that are actually differentially affected in the worst way seem to be the most resistant for a variety of reasons. Well, you know, we have a lot of faculty here, but we also, I'm sure at, at, at Tokyo Tech and certainly at MIT, you know, we're looking at the social science of how you sell the safety of vaccines. And again, it's just one more example that you have to, in the new normal, break down disciplinary boundaries. And I also think you do it in teaching. And uh, I happened to teach my econ course today, and I'm, I'm a real Luddite, unlike my fellow presidents. I, I literally have a closet full. It's not old typewriters. This is just a, a relic from my, uh, my uh, mother-in-law, blessed memory, was her uh, typewriter in the, in the 1940s when she was a reporter, uh, one of the few female reporters in the New York Post back when it was a real paper. But I do have a, uh, I have a um, closet full of chalk and erasers. But when I taught today, you know, with this transition to the new normal, I'm proud to say I used the whiteboard function, I downloaded videos, I did my mathematical equations and graphs were coming out. And for somebody who's a dinosaur, it reminded me that, you know, when we talk about flipping the classroom, you know, don't just give lectures and then the grad students teach them in small discussions. Let's put the videos of our lectures online let's actually engage with the students. And, you know, I, I love teaching, but there's an old saying, I don't know if you, some of you are aware of it, that it's easier to change the course of history than a history course. Very funny line. But unfortunately, some students aren't laughing because, in fact, it's the, the onus, the burden is on us as faculty in the new normal to embrace technology, you know, not only in our research, but in our teaching. And then finally, you know, as a labor economist, I work on the fourth industrial revolution and, you know, what's the best kind of education? And boy, I love to list the commitments from Tokyo Tech because it's exactly what I'm going to say right now. As a labor economist, and, you know, I'm looking at, at, at you, President Reef, you know, David Autor, the greatest labor economist happens to be on your faculty, uh, also Northwestern parent, I might add, but great labor economist. And when you look at David's, you know, analysis of, what do you do in a world of outsourcing, a world of artificial intelligence, a world of automation? How can you ensure that the jobs you're trained for as undergrads and grad students are still going to exist in the years ahead? You know, when I 
entered the labor force when I graduated college in 75, PhD in, in 79. In those days, you picked an occupation and you had three or four employees over a lifetime. You know what it is now. You go from one occupation to another. You try teaching through Teach for, for America and the like. And then you go to law school. Then you work in business. Then you get rich enough to work in the, the not-for-profit sector. The best, I think, as a labor economist, the best way to ensure that those that employment's going to be there in the future is what? It's creativity, it's resilience, it's empathy. It's basically the list of Tokyo Tech uh, commitments. I have one minute to go and I want to tell a quick story. A lot of my students in econ math want to work in Korea. Now, a lot of them are Korean Americans and they never, some of them have never been back to the homeland. Some of them don't speak a word of Korean, but they're fascinated about getting back to Korea. And because I do the econ math, they come up to me and they say, Professor Shapiro, President Shapiro, I have one more course to take before I graduate. I'm trying to think about this econometrics course, my field applied econometrics, or this math course, another version of you know, nonlinear differential equations or something. And you know what I say to them? I said, you know, you know enough math, you know enough statistics, and you know enough economics. If you really want to work in Korea, take Korean language, take Asian religion, take Korean literature, take Korean history, and that will prepare you for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your in very engaging speech. Um, uh, we are very ready to um, have your um, students from Northwestern University, and then uh, the President Shun will give us some tips for your students later. <laughs> Um, of course, universities have a, a very fundamental role in uh, shaping the future of our society. And so that's why um, your widely acclaimed book, Sense and Sensibility, uh, What Economics Can Learn from the Humanities. So you emphasize the importance of uh, mm -hmm. interdisciplinary research. So maybe we could also discuss about this issue uh, during the uh, panel session. So thank you very much, President Shapiro. Thank you. So lastly, uh, we'll hear from our uh, KAIST president, uh, Song Chol Shin. Uh, president Shin is a renowned physicist, particularly in the field of nanomagnetism. He first joined the KAIST faculty in 1989 and held key positions, including vice president. In 2017, he came back to KAIST as the first alumnus to serve as president of KAIST. He has also been deeply involved in national strategy and policy making for science and technology. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure uh, you will have very insightful uh, contribution on today's topic uh, under this, uh, this titled Vision and Innovations for the Next Dream of KAIST. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me first express my deep gratitude to the uh, eminent speakers for their participation in this summit, despite their very tight schedules and also for their thought-provoking presentation. Well, in my talk, I'd like to present our new vision and innovation for the next dream of KAIST. The foundation report of KAIST, so-called Thurman Report, state the dream of the future, that KAIST will, by the year 2000, be a great institute of technology with the international reputation. It will have a spearhead a new era in education, even more important, KAIST will have enhanced the self-confidence of Koreans. This dream has come true. KAIST has been behind the Korea's advancement in science and technology and miraculous economic growth achieved within half a century. Many people say, if not for KAIST, Korea would not exist as it is today. Since the foundation, KAIST has nurtured nearly 70,000 graduates including 14,500 PhDs, they have played pivotal roles in industry, university, research institute, and government. For instance, about 25% of a PhD workforce in the Korean semiconductor industry having global competitiveness are KAIST graduates. About 20% of the Korean university engineering faculty are also our graduates. Mentioning about the international ranking, Thomson Reuters ranked 
Kai State is the most innovative university in the Asia Pacific region for three consecutive years and 11th in the world. As such, Kai State is a shining example of the USAID science and technology program. USAID states that Kai State provides an example of how Korea, once a recipient of international aid, has become a science, technology, innovation, and policy leader. So the dream of KAIST that is conceived 50 years ago has mostly come true. Now we are marching forward to realize our next dream. For our next dream, we envision to become a global value creative leading university, creating academic, technological, economic, and social value at the global level, thus become a university of science and technology innovation for humanity's happiness and prosperity. To this end, we have established a strategic innovation plan in the five areas. For education, we will first create leaders who will translate knowledge into social value. For research, we will conduct research to overcome challenges for humanity. For technology commercialization, we will pursue an entrepreneurial university that will enrich its technological value. For globalization, KAIPS will move forward to solve as a world bridge. For future strategies, KAIPS will provide science-based policies on the global issues in the international community. Well, let me elaborate our innovations in those five areas. Talking about innovation for education, what kind of manpower should be fostered in the era of the fourth industrial revolution and post-coronavirus era? It's a very crucial question for every university in the coming years. We, KAIST, will foster talent equipped with a challenge, creativity, caring, namely CQ talent, challenge that can cope with unsolved questions in ways that have not been tried before. Creativity, they can solve the problems with innovative ideas via collaboration. Caring is an attitude of inclusiveness and ethical responsibility. We opened the School of Transdisciplinary Studies to foster convergent talents who can create new knowledge through a cross-disciplinary approach. This new school aims to nurture students with the strengthening basic science and engineering education, humanities and social science convergent education, entrepreneurship education, and global leadership education. We cannot stress enough the importance of AI education for the first industrial revolution. So we emphasize AI education across the entire curriculum for undergrad studies. We opened the grade school of AI for the first time in Korea in 2019. We plan to foster more than 100 graduate students annually. Talking about innovation for research, we want to be a first mover with our research. Our goal is to produce the world's best, first, well, only research outcome, and we shift our R&D strategies to focus on creating global value. We designate a KAIST flagship project in biomedical area, energy and environment area, space and defense area, and the first industrial revolution research area. We select the most futuristic project and provide the block funding for up to 10 years, pushing for making the best first well only outcome. One of the flagship projects, so-called COBRA project, this project is aiming for regeneration and recovery of the damaged neuron in the, in the brain using light, and eventually aiming for treatment of a Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. While COVID-19 is affecting the entire world, it gives our university new opportunities to accelerate the advancement of medical and bioengineering breakthroughs. We launched the COVID-19 antivirus New Deal R&D initiative last year. 
led by 44 of our faculty members. The initiative involves more than 120 experts from universities, industries, and hospitals. We will develop antivirus core technology for prevention, diagnosis, protection, and treatment. So this video clip demonstrates a mobile negative pressure room system that was recently developed. This mobile system is being sent to virus stricken area, can be constructed within a few days. Ultimately, we hope to contribute to creating new antivirus industry and enhance the well-being of the humanity. We have launched a singulator professorship to support one-of-a-kind young professors who will work adamantly to challenge the unsolved big questions or to, to seek out the most intriguing academic disciplines with unrivaled creativity. We will support their research ideas with full-scale research funding for up to 10 years without any annual evaluation. Talking about innovation for technology commercialization, KAIS has been the cradle of the startups in Korea. Our alumni have founded more than 1,200 startups, yielding $14 billion in annual revenue and creating 45,000 new jobs. We strongly encourage our students and professors to establish startups. To support them, we have launched the Institute of Startups, KAIS, in 2014. The Institute aims to invigorate entrepreneurship on campus, create an ecosystem in which startups can thrive, and help startups go abroad. To this end, the Institute provides the KAIS community with workspaces as well as training on practical business skills. For the past four years, 94 KAIS startups have been launched with an initial investment of $67 million. To boost up technology commercialization, KAIS implement so-called the triple helix education model in the graduate school, which well aligns education, research, and technology commercialization. The class and labs take on research topics that can address on-site issues which companies experience, and R&D results immediately lead to commercialization. So this video clip shows that one of the graduate classes with a triple helix model resolved the issues in an automatic distribution system for a semiconductor company. KAIS now benchmark a role model university benchmarked by other countries. Many nations are eager to establish KAIS in their countries. The first example is a Kenya KAIS project, which is to build a science and technology-oriented university, nurturing highly skilled workforce for Kenya's fast-track modernization. KAIS is the first Korean university providing turnkey-based consultancy, including educational curriculum, architectural design, and construction in a foreign country. This project is transforming KAIS from a recipient of a foreign aid to a donor status after only 50 years. We are planning to establish 10 KAIS around the world over the next 50 years, which will provide KAIS an opportunity to contribute to the global community. As for innovation for future strategies, we have launched the Global Strategy Institute, GSI, last year. GSI identifies the global issues proactively and provides science-based policies and strategies through international forums. This GSI aims to be a science-based global think tank. What will be our dream over the next 50 years? we would like to realize 10, 10, 10 dream. Those are to produce 10 singularity professors with world-renowned academic reputation, to produce 10 Decacon startups with a company value of $10 billion, and to establish 10 x KAIS around the world, including Kenya KAIS. 
Now let me conclude my presentation with a promise. KAIST will emerge as a university of science, technology, innovation for humanity's happiness and prosperity in the coming 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Shin. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to a bright future for KAIST. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have heard from all of our um, distinguished speakers. Um, you're very punctual, so thank you very much uh, once again. So we'll move on to our panel discussion for in-depth um, talk. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're going to consider uh, roughly um, three themes for uh, this session uh, that I think were covered uh, across all the speeches. Um, uh, you touched upon the emerging challenges of uh, digital technologies, um, such as digital divide, and also the challenges in artificial intelligence and other uh, emerging technologies. And also, um, some of the speeches uh, uh, touched upon uh, university industry collaboration and innovation and uh, social entrepreneurship. So, um, let's start with the issue of uh, digital divide. We know that uh, there are many uh, inequality, social <coughs> inequality and political inequality issues in our society, but in particular, uh, disparity in access to information and online services and education, and these have been emphasized by the pandemic uh, as well. So how should universities address this um, persistent or mm. seemingly persistent uh, digital disparities through uh, their education or uh, research? So, um, shall we start from uh, President Reif? Maybe would you like to take the lead first? Uh, sure, thank you for the question. <laughs> I, it's, uh, you're right that, that the pandemic uh, uh, made us all uh, send our students home and then they have to learn from home. And, and that, that uh, opened up a huge mm -hmm. digital divide. Uh, some students have access to Wi-Fi at home some students have a, a laptop at home that they can use, uh, but many don't. So uh, the first thing we had to do is just figure out how to help and how to uh, understand and address the divide. In our case, we, we send them all um, with uh, 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 hot, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots that we send to their homes. Uh, we decided to pay for the cell phone bills because that's how the hotspots work. Uh, we send them, we loan them all iPads, uh, we send them uh, laptops. Uh, we try to facilitate um, uh, mm -hmm. at, at cost uh, yeah. to us, of course, but facilitate the digital device so they can actually get the education while away from, uh, from MIT. Uh, beyond that, it's just very hard to figure out what to do to help them. It turns out that that was very welcome uh, and the students enjoy that. But at the same time, not all of them live in a comfortable quarters and they have a separate room in which they can study. Uh, I, I, I Zoom with them, I have conversations with them the way we do right now very often uh, throughout the <clears> pandemic. <throat> and, and most of them are studying in a little kitchen when, when, when you know, a relative shows up and cooks and it's not conducive. So even we send them all that assistance, uh, still the divide is not, this is not a digital divide, it's a divide in terms of socioeconomic divide and one that uh, President Shapiro understands very well. Uh, that, that is something that is very hard to fix. So you're addressing a very important problem. Uh, we're doing what we can uh, and it's hard to think what else we can do to help. Thank you very much. Um, Right, so um, uh, I'd like to note that MIT is, uh, um, and you've been pioneering the online education and also starting uh, edX project with the Harvard University in um, early 2010. I've heard that the last year, um, the edX had uh, over 20 million users. So I think under your leadership, it was a great achievement. Mm -hmm. Right, so... Um, well, would you like to uh, add more comments on that, your practice? Well, I think, I think, well, I think the, 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 the good news there is that we have been using, as you said, uh, uh, edX and, and that platform of online learning platform for a number of years. So when this the pandemic occurred that we have to send students home, it was a drastic change for us. But, but the good news for us is that we are used to flipping the classroom and doing that. So, so it was not such a huge change for us or for others. Uh, and I think 
we are one thing we're learning right now from that experience is that our students do want to come back to campus thank god they thank goodness they do want to come back uh, they miss being on campus but they also enjoy some of the features they're getting by this forced experiment of everybody studying from home mm -hmm. uh, using our platform. Uh, so, and they want, as smart students always want, a hybrid of the benefits of being on campus with the benefits of being away and, and, and how to combine those two things. And that's something that we're actually working, how to integrate those two, the technology and their on-campus presence and the physical interaction to get for them to get the whole education they wish to receive. Mm -hmm. Right, I think uh, you raised the very important issues about hybrid education online and offline um, campus uh, uh, dedications. So maybe President Masu, um, you could, um, you may simply respond to the President Rife's answer, uh, but I, I was very interested in your uh, DREV approach. So from your perspective, what are the emerging challenges um, um, in, in universities in, the, in this hyper-connected and digitalized society? Uh, here, I want to uh, make some comments in the digital divide in the uh, graduate level education here, okay? The recently, I think uh, some students in the, for example, material or chemical or mechanical engineering students have to know the AI or data science knowledge. So it's very important to, uh, important for the students who, uh, students uh, who have a special, like, uh, special field of chemical or mechanical or uh, material student to, to, uh, in, to survive in the field of the science and technology. So in Tokyo Tech, we have studied the DI or AI uh, class for mm -hmm. a class in the graduate level. It is important to overcome the digital divide in the field uh, in the graduate level. Okay. Thank you very much, President Masu. Um, President Shapiro, um, Actually, the large problem causing uh, this um, current digital divide that we see is economic um, disparity as well. So I'd like to ask, how can university uh, effectively contribute to um, diminishing this gap? Wish I knew the answer to that one. I'll tell you <laughs> that I'd get a Nobel Prize like some of our faculty. Um, you know, since 1979 in this country, since a couple of years after that, in most of the Western world, there's been an extraordinary increase in income and wealth inequality, a uh, number of Asian countries as well. It was not anything anybody expected. When I first started teaching at Penn in 1979, I, I reviewed the data on income inequality and I said, look at the difference, how much equal the distribution of income and wealth is in this country from 1900 to 1979. Over the course of my career, I'll see us getting closer and closer to that 45 degree line with a more equal distribution. And it turned out that was the peak. The last time we've had this degree of wealth inequality in this country was 1928, right before the onset of the Great Depression. So nobody expected it. If you look at the grades that Simon Kuznets, Schumpeter, <laughs> Nobody saw this coming and, and, and it's a complicated answer. So I couldn't begin to say that universities could do all that much to reverse it. Part of it is related to the slowdown in the growth in labor productivity. Part of it is just due to the winner take all society where people who graduate from MIT and Tokyo Tech and Northwestern mm -hmm. have a wealth possibility that's so much in excess of what it was two generations ago. And everybody who goes to other schools have a very different path, particularly in a COVID era, where the, your initial earnings have a profound impact on your earnings 25 years out. I'm sorry to say, if anybody's about to graduate into this terrible global market. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to figure out what we do. I, I do think that addressing it in an interdisciplinary way, uh, trying to use technology, trying to use 
social sciences with the humanities is our best way to go forward. But I would never be so presumptuous to assume that Northwestern and these other organizations, other great educational institutions can reverse a trend that has been now the case in many countries for over 40 years. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just follow up and quickly ask one, one simple question. So you just mentioned about kind of technological, uh, the impact of technological change, uh, which is often expected to lead uh, socioeconomic transformation, but not, not, not necessarily always in a uh, positive direction. So from point of view, maybe as a, a labor economist, uh, would you like to share your insight on that? Uh, you, you just summarized it perfectly. I don't know what else I can add. You know, some of the changes are good. Some of the changes are bad. Uh, there's certainly been a whole bunch of Steve Pickner and others have documented that a lot of the world is a lot better than it, than it is. I'm also trained as a demographer, economist slash demographer. And you, know, you look at life expectancy at birth, you look at the declines in total fertility rates, you look at you know, a whole bunch of decreases in morbidity as well as mortality across the developing world. I mean, there's been great progress, but, and some of that is related to innovations that come from the MITs of the world, certainly. But we got a lot, we can't declare victory. And I think the pandemic, as both of my illustrious counterparts here said, it uncovered some existing inequalities and injustices that, you know, to put our head in the sand and pretend we don't know it would be doing a disservice to society. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. President Shapiro. Um, over to the President Shin. Um, KAIS has now operated uh, online um, courses for more than a year, mm -hmm. um, as have many other universities around the world. Um, we too have had to think about how to mm -hmm. solve this problem of uh, mm -hmm. digital gap. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, many of our audiences here um, would be very interested in uh, learning how KAIS has responded to mm -hmm. um, this new situation. Well, uh, according to a recent survey in Korea, about 96% of citizens agree that the uh, pandemic continues to widen the existing learning gap. It is obvious that digital, digital disparity will accelerate the educational inequality, eventually leading to irreparable socioeconomic disparities. After WHO declared pandemic, Kai State's immediate response to in order to sustain its educational environment. And we are carrying out several activities to facilitate a more equal and inclusive recovery for the future. Right after the pandemic, we announced online education without fixing the ending date. The first week of online classes was pretty rough, but from the second week, everything went smoothly. Our smooth transition to full online education was driven by the Education 4.0 initiative, which is basically a flipped learning system that began in 2012. I feel fortunate that full-scale online classes we started during the pandemic served as a very positive momentum to advance the Education 4.0. Students, faculty, and staff are adjusting well to the new environment, and we are successfully transitioning to 100% online education, which might have taken another 10 years if the pandemic had not uh, appeared. I also would like to mention that we will reach out to our local community. Student volunteers help the schools and teachers set up online classes. I am pleased that we could play a part in creating this virtual circle to build a better community. For the wider general public, KAIS has provided various MOOC courses. Now we are offering 88 classes on MOOCs in collaboration with other universities in Korea. Well, virtual university using online education will play a crucial role, especially in the corona and post-corona era. This virtual university will help many employees who wish to upskill and reskill their careers by offering lifelong education platform. So in this regard, I'd like to propose the establishment of a global MOOC consortium in collaboration with the leading universities around the world. 
This will be an effective global collaboration in higher education that can contribute to benefiting the wider global community. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Shin. You just mentioned about the importance of global collaboration. Yes, yes. So I think uh, it's one of the uh, most important tasks mm. uh, of universities uh, in the future. Also, mm. President Masu also mentioned about the importance of uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we will discuss about this issue later. It's definitely also needed uh, in the case of our um, second theme, which is a uh, different type of uh, uh, challenges. Um, it could be social, political, cultural, and ethical challenges in artificial intelligence and other emerging digital technology. Um, but before we move on, um, is there anything uh, we're leaving out here that needs to be addressed? Would you like to add on comments? Or we can, mm. or we can continue to the, uh, uh, our, the second theme of new challenges of uh, artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. So AI is emerging uh, very uh, rapidly, um, and universities must, uh, of course, adapt in uh, managing these uh, challenges. So um, maybe once again, President Reif, um, you received your bachelor's degree uh, in electrical engineering 40 years ago, um, and amazing things have happened uh, since then, in, uh, especially <coughs> in ICT sector. What do you think about the next 40 years? Um, how can we um, maximize the benefits of emerging digital technologies while uh, minimizing the uh, potential uh, risks? Well, th thank you for the question. I think, I think the future, uh, seeing, we're seeing the very beginning of something very new with the use of uh, AI technologies uh, like machine learning and others uh, to help us uh, practice our profession and to help us do research. And, and, I, and I really believe that the advances in research will increase exponentially compared to some linear extrapolation in the past, thanks to technologies like AI. I think the, the, the challenge you're, you're mentioning is a very serious one though, that Traditionally, uh, institutions like ours have been advancing technology uh, because it's the thing you do without really thinking about the consequences of those advances on society. And, and AI has moved so rapidly and has caused such a huge disruption that that opened our eyes. An institution like ours, and I'm sure all of those on the screen today and, and many more, are now educating students, certainly we are, um, not just advancing technologies, and I'm not now talking about AI, all technologies that we move at MIT, that we educate with and that we advance and research, but we are now integrating that advance, those advances with a way to think, how is that going to help society? How is that gonna impact society? How do we advance it the right way? So for example, one way is to advance AI as a way to replace humans Another way to think about advancing AI is as a way to assist humans. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very subtle different changes that allows the student being educated, those who are going to be driving uh, the, the economy for the next 20, 30, perhaps 40 years, uh, they need to understand that, that what they create has an impact and not always could be positive. So the effort we're making right now is trying to address, mitigate, the, the impact on society that could be negative and try to take advantage of the potential positive society that could be huge. Uh, to give you an idea of how huge things could be, right now science and technology advances when we have a model to describe a physical phenomena and we can use the model typically based on an equation to try to figure out how to predict what's gonna happen based on that equation, based on that theory. And we use those equations the engineers do to build things well, I mean, there are many, many things, uh, including how our human body behaves or how biology behaves that cannot be described by the universal theory and, a, and, a, and an equation, and you cannot make predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the science does exist. It just, we cannot describe it with an equation the way we do it in physics or in chemistry. Well, that's where the uh, technologies like AI will help you. We'll be able to make predictions of what's gonna happen based on data 
even though we cannot describe it mathematically. So basically, I give you a, a glimpse on the future is very, very exciting, but we have to make sure we understand and mitigate and address the negative consequences of advancing technology without understanding its impact on society. Thank you very much, President Reif. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'd like to invite President Shapiro um, to give us like the pers different perspective from maybe social science perspective, <laughs> right? So you're the only one um, president here um, from social science field. So um, um, one of the quick questions is what's going to be uh, the future of jobs and uh, university education? So you've been conducting a lot of researches in the intersection between economics and policy and higher education. So would you like to share um, your thoughts on that? Well, I just reiterate what we learned from my colleague from Tokyo Tech. That if you don't have, I love this generation. They have very great abilities and, and work ethic and everything. Resilience, not so much. So I, I think to be successful, you better be able to retrain and reorient yourself on a, on, a, on a moment's notice. So you need to be resilient. You need to be creative. You do engineering, maybe design engineering and the like. So, but you know, a lot of people speculate it. But let me go back to your question and what Ralph just said about trying to anticipate the, the social impact of technological change. And that's really hard to do. And I love in your original way you posed the question, you said, you know, about, eth use the word ethics. And uh, let me just say quickly, in my class today, I asked them, I said, okay, let's debate what the best way to allocate vaccines is. And I don't know what's going on in Korea or Japan, but in this country, very much. I don't know Massachusetts, but Illinois, who gets first and, you know, and what's the right thing. And some of my students said, oh, the fairest thing is a lottery. Everybody gets a ticket. And if you studied Theory of Justice, John Rawls behind the veil of ignorance. You might be able to argue some just some ethical justification for that. Uh, the economists in my class said, "Oh no, no, no! It's it's the quality adjusted years of life, not unlike how you decide who gets treated in national health in England and other countries. Uh, you know, and and therefore you give it first to people with who are younger, so they have more years to productively, you know, enhance world." economic growth and the like, and people with better education because they earn more. And I'm going, okay, you're really, you're going to exacerbate existing inequalities by giving it to richer, younger people who are better educated. Is that what you want to do? And then some said, no, 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 be, be pragmatic. The people who are clogging up the emergency rooms are people from nursing homes. So let's, let's give the vaccines to nursing homes so they stay out so you can treat younger people and get them healthy. And I said, well, what about maybe older people deserve to die even if they have dementia with dignity and without being terrified? And maybe morally, the right thing to do is to treat the most vulnerable, even if they're not going to contribute to economic well-being for all the rest of us. And I got a lot of blank stares, I have to tell you. So I, I think... You're scientists, I'm not, but I think you would agree that from originally cloning to one thing after another, now AI, the science and technology is so far ahead of the ethical discussion. And I think it's on us at universities to be leaders in that ethical discussion. Thank you very much, President Shapiro, for opening up this, um, the issue of the ethics of uh, AI. Um, maybe President Shin, um, so recently, AI has become a major uh, mm -hmm. buzzword in Korea. Uh, in KAIS, we also have School of AI, mm -hmm. and then we also have a scholars um, studying on the ethical issues of mm -hmm. AI, including mm -hmm. Professor Chan chi mm -hmm. uh, In your opinion, uh, how can university continue to make contribution uh, in AI while mm -hmm. promoting uh, ethical uh, okay. standard? Well, you know, four years ago, we were so shocked by the fact that Google developed AI AlphaGo, achieved the landslide victories against the human go champions such as Isedol in Korea and Kwaje in China. And now we are witnessing the rapid progress of AI due to the deep learning, brain science, and big data, together with advancing computer hardware. Nowadays, AI is an enabler of diverse industries, 
including autonomous vehicles, drone, speech processing, healthcare, finance, manufacturing, robot, and so on. In the near future, AI robot, which I call robot sapiens, will be everywhere. Therefore, we have to think seriously about the identity of a human being. We Homo sapiens will not be able to compete with the robot sapiens with regard to memorizing, information processing, calculating, and physical abilities. Therefore, in our education, we should further cultivate the irreplaceable merits of a human being, such as creativity, empathy, insight, and wisdom. To six symbioses between Homo sapiens and Robo sapiens. More importantly, we need to consider ethical issues when employing AI robots in industry as well as in our daily lives. We need to put tremendous efforts into preventing the potential dark side of AI in the coming digital society. For a bright digital society. I would like to emphasize that ethical education is the most important. We have to teach our students about ethics of AI algorithm and social responsibility in utilizing and manipulating digital devices. KAIST requires the students to take AI and digital ethics as a compulsory course. I also would like to mention that global collaborative governance system. Should be set up because a bright digital society will not be realized by the effort of a single country or the effort of a single university. Otherwise, we will confront the dark side of the digital society caused by unethical AI, such as killer robots, which will bring about a chaotic dystopia rather than a digital utopia. Thank you very much, President Chin. Um, Um, so now, maybe over to um, President Masu. Um, you could also uh, respond to the uh, previous answers, uh, and also maybe you could also connect um, your own experiences uh, in Tokyo Tech's D Lab for uh, social innovation, for uh, tackling uh, different type of challenges in our society. So, based on your um, experiences, um, what is the most effective way for universities to Uh, tackle these challenges and promote. Um, you mentioned about social entrepreneurship, or engage with uh, mm -hmm. different uh, stakeholders in our society. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> before uh, making comments, I fully agree with uh, President Singh's opinion. The ethical or social science education or knowledge is very important to young researchers or scientists. As well as scientists and engineers. So, in my opinion, relating to the social challenge in challenges uh, relating to DRA, the I asked my our PhD students to join the DRA was a DRA activities uh, because the. Many of PhD students or graduate students wants to. Deepen their own specialties, but the of course the deepen, deepening the specialty is important for uh, scientific students. But they have to recognize uh, how or what will be the uh, uh, what uh, what is the future of the their own specialties. So in order to uh, think about their future. They have to discuss the future. So, DRAB's activities is very important for scientific and uh, uh, scientific and uh, engineers who wants to uh, deepen their own specialties. So, I think uh, DRAB activities will be helpful for the scientific uh, students as well as. Another technological, uh, technical universities. Thank you very much, President Masu. Um, um, I think uh, we already got um, very uh, interesting questions from from the um, online participants. 
So, um, but before we move on uh, our Q&A session, um, is there any comments uh, on that from presidents? All right. So then uh, we'd like to... Excuse me. Um, I have, please, please I go have ahead. One, one question. All present emphasizes the importance of online education. Online education is very important tool, but in technical universities, the other important one is experiments. The, for example, the undergraduate or graduate level. How do we carry out the uh, education relating experiment, such as chem chemistry or uh, physics? It's a <laughs> big question for me. How do you think about it? <laughs> Absolutely, it's a fantastic uh, questions. So, President Shin, maybe you'd yeah, like to Yeah, I think that's that. the same, same problem in all the universities, how we implement online education in yeah. the experimental you know, it's, uh, subjects such as a physics experiment, chemistry experiment. Uh, <laughs> so, it, uh, in the case of our university, actually, uh, we carry out, uh, you know, it's, uh, Offline classes for experimental uh, classes, okay. So for for the few students, uh, not yeah. many students. So we have to you know confine the st number of students. But eventually, you know, interesting thing is that according to course evaluation of uh, online education, uh, it's much better than offline course evaluation. That's mm. in, in very interesting result mm. for us. Mm. So uh, after pandemic, I think still online education will combine the offline education, mm. so so-called you know, blended education with the norm. So we have to utilize the online education uh, during the you know, teaching and offline education for, uh, for discussion, especially for Oriental society like Korea. You know, the discussion is very important to you know, to, um, motivate the critical thinking and enhance the creativity. Mm. So the answer for them, it's not answer actually, <laughs> but blended education mm. with the norm uh, after um, okay. post-corona. Thank you, I agree with your opinion. Thank you very much. And how about the, uh, the practice uh, of the United States? Uh, President Shapiro, you, you just raised the, uh, just your hand. It's very hard to do lab science, laboratory experiments remotely. It's also, you know, we have a very big music school at Northwestern. Uh, it's really hard to, and we train people for the, the world's great orchestras. You can't do that remotely. Uh, we have a very big theater program. You ever go to Broadway or the West End and, and you see how many Northwestern alums, you can't do shows remotely. So there's a lot of things. And I love what Ralph said before about MIT. You know, so much of the education is not when they're in our classes. It's what happens in the dorms. And, you know, when you preside over reunions, and I've been doing this for 22 years, and I say to these people when they're back for their 10th, their 25th, or their 50th, and I say, tell me why you're back. What made you fall in love with this institution? And they say, you know, we, I was with my friends, and we, we played intramural sport, and we won the club championship. Or we stayed up all night and we watched the sunrise, you know, or, you know, we, we did this community service project and planting trees or going to a retirement home and they go on and on and on. And finally, I said, did you ever take a course? Because they go through like number nine when they say, oh, I took econ, I took physics, I took chemistry. You know, for them, you know, I hope we have a lasting impact. But as Ralph said so beautifully before about MIT, a lot of the, 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 the grandeur, if you will, of the MIT education is not what happens a couple hours a week in the classroom. It's peers educating each other about not just science, but about life outside. And you cannot do that on a MOOC. I have a lot of confidence. There are some things you can do that you cannot. Thank you, President Shapiro. Uh, President Reif, would you like to respond briefly on that? No, I, I agree with everything that was said. I, I think the only thing that I can mention is that uh, our faculty have been very creative uh, to try to do labs at home. 
and, and they send they send kids, uh, you know, just little kids to the students for them to practice with them. And, and they, 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 they do some kind of hands on laboratory experiments at home. Wow. But no, it's not the mm -hmm. same. And I think, uh, but the key point that President Shapiro said is crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. Students learn in a university, at least at this one, I'm sure that everyone learn from each other much more than they learn from any of us. And, uh, and, and that, that's the beauty and the value added of coming to a campus. Uh, I think they want to come to campus to learn from each other, but they don't want to come to the classroom. They'd rather do the thing online from their dorms. I mean, mm -hmm. they want the, that's, that's, that's the hybrid thing. They, they, mm -hmm. want, they want the experience of seeing uh, the professor, the way, the way I see you, uh, the faces are there talking to me and they can actually do it live and watch it again two hours later if they want to. But they want to do it here, not from home, because they want to be with their mm -hmm. classmates, with their friends, and they learn mm -hmm. from each other a great deal. That's brilliant the way President Shapiro said. That's the, that's the truth. That's the best education they can get. Thank you very much for a uh, uh, very insightful discussion. Um, so now we'd like to move on to the Q&A session. And then uh, I actually found very um, relevant questions um, from one of the, uh, our online participants. Um, Jake Park? Um, Jake Park? All right. So. Would you like to briefly introduce yourself and ask the question? Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, okay. So my name is Jake Park, as Professor Park introduced, and I am planning to enter as a freshman of Heist this year. Okay. So first of all, I would like to express my dearest gratitude to all the presidents for their time and thoughtful insights. My question is, do you think that the changes you have discussed to the university paradigm, paradigm, whether it be related to research or online courses, should be temporary or something that we should keep even if the pandemic completely ends? And if it's the latter, why shouldn't we go back to the way life used to be? Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to um, respond to the questions from Jake. Take part? Well, I, let, let me try it. I think uh, I think I was I I learned so much from from my three colleague presidents that I was hoping one of them would pick it up so I can listen to them. Uh, mm. I think uh, I I don't think things were going to come back to exactly the way they were, but but we have to appreciate the following. Uh, as we were commenting earlier, the the coming to a campus to get an education and, and be there with other students, studying with them and so forth and interacting with them and learning from them and from each other is really the best education there is. Uh, I, but on the other hand, it's expensive. Let's recognize that it's the best, but it's expensive. Online gives us the opportunity to provide education to many, many more students that those are, we can house on a campus. Uh, but of course, it's not the same. So I think, I think that is, that is gonna be part of our future. Uh, online education is, is more massive, can reach many more people, uh, but it's not the same as coming to campus. One possible ideal scenario, which are the students are telling me, once they practice it, I don't know whether they like it, which is to combine them both, to be on campus, to be with other students, to attend labs, but maybe the lectures, they don't have to come to the classroom. Let's see how that evolves. But the truth is, things will not come back to being exactly where they were before. Uh, we, I have right now a task force to look, I started that last spring, to look at 2021 and beyond. How, how, are, we, how are we gonna be seeing or doing things after COVID? Assuming there is, I'm gonna use Prof. President Shapiro version, uh, the new normal. Uh, and and there, I had a meeting with the task force today to get to get where they are. There are many ideas and many many ways to imagine how things are going to be when we come back. Uh, but 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 it's clear that it's not going to be the same. Uh, but we're going to probably take advantage of the best of what we had with the best of what's coming with the experience we have online. Mm -hmm. All right. Any I offer a little advice. It's not yes. exactly the question, but I can't improve on the answer that was just given. I, you know, obviously, Thank congratulations you. on getting admitted into Kaiser. You're obviously <laughs> a brilliant student. Um, 
you're also probably a student who hasn't failed very much. Uh, previous generations, we succeeded and we failed. We got cut from our baseball teams because we're unathletic. We didn't get a trophy in guaranteed time. You know, it's a different way to raise kids. I have three of my own. Trust me, I know what it's about. Everybody always wins. So when you get to Kais, my advice for you is, you know, to build that resilience. You don't get resilience if only you do is succeed. So take risks. Be prepared to fail. You're still going to get a Kais degree. It's going to set you up for the rest of your life in whatever field you want to enter. But I think to be prepared, not just to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution, but also in life, I think you need to take risks and don't be so afraid of failure. And when you fail as many times as I do, have and continue to do, you get a thicker skin that uh, my kids should have one day. That's my little advice. Thank you very much. Um, so um, maybe we'd like to um, have another question, uh, maybe um, that actually goes to the President Shin first. So, um, Eden, Eden Binaga, what should I call you, Eden? Yes, Eden, yes, that's right. right. So mm -hmm. are you particularly um, mm -hmm. asking the questions to <clears throat> Kais or in general? It's a general question, it okay. can go to... Professors, yeah. Okay, could you briefly introduce yourself and then ask the question? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Park, and thank you very much all the four university presidents of the top universities in the world. I'm really honored to participate in this program. I am Aiden Binego. I am a KAIST master student. I'm going to graduate this February, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to it. I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, my question will be, uh, what does KAIST or your respective universities in MIT or Tokyo take or uh, Northwestern University uh, do to collaborate uh, more effectively with industries, uh, both uh, domestically, that means nationally and internationally? And what can students do to make their work more uh, successfully applicable or feasible in industries? Of course, we publish a lot of papers, but uh, are those papers more feasible and can they be connected to the industry? Uh, thank you very much for your time. All right, President Shin, it was right to- Well, thank you for the wonderful question, Eden. You know, one of the major missions of KAIST to forestall elite scientists and engineers who play a leading role in technological innovation of companies. Nearly half of our graduates are now working in companies. Therefore, our university has established a very close relationship with large Korean corporations, including Samsung, LG, Hyundai, and SK, but also with foreign companies, such as Google, IBM, and Aramco. Uh, recently, KAIS also has been paying special attention to upgrade a small and medium-sized enterprise, SMEs, which account for 97% of the total number of companies in Korea. For instance, last December, we launched a Korea AI manufacturing platform, namely Comp. Comp aims to help SMEs transform into AI-powered smart factories. These smart factories will significantly reduce defect rates as well as help resolve the chronic shortage of manpower. Let me give some advice to the students like Eden uh, who are interested in uh, technology commercialization. KAIST provides a variety of internship programs in a large number of companies. Please look into participating in an internship program on-site experience could be very valuable uh, for your career in the future. KAIST also carry out numerous industry-funded projects. You should consider participating in those projects. It would provide you with a good opportunity to learn applied and commercialized research abilities. Finally, please take part in entrepreneurship education programs, such as a capstone design program, and Master of Entrepreneurship and Innovation program that KAIST offers. I hope this answered your question. Right, uh, there's also related questions from one of our Professor Emeritus, uh, Yang Dong-yeol. 
um, on the, uh, the research collaboration on the interdisciplinary research. Um, are you there, in Professor Yes. Young? Hello. <laughs> All right. Would you like to uh, briefly introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Dong Yang, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at KAIST. And uh, actually, uh, I was the first graduate of KAIST. And I served, uh, I worked uh, for five years as students. And then I also served uh, 38 years at KAIST as professor. And uh, my question is uh, somewhat general. Even in this age of a pandemic uh, environment uh, derived from uh, COVID-19, uh, technology fusion and uh, this interdisciplinary collaboration are still more important, as we all know. I'm wondering whether there are any practical ways to effectively promote uh, uh, technology fusion and the interdisciplinary collaboration, even in this uh, untapped society. Thank you. Great. So what is the strategy of the interdisciplinary research during the uh, uh, pandemic? Um, maybe President Masu from... Uh, in order to enhance the... Uh, in order to enhance the interdisciplinary research, the, I think the um, partic uh, young researchers' participation is very important. So. Uh, we have many workshops or uh, meetings uh, within young researchers within our university or uh, including uh, young researchers from other, another university or industry. The um, meeting of interdisciplinary researchers, especially young researchers, is very important, I think. Thank you very much. Um, any, um, any different idea on that from other, uh, other presidents? Well, I, I would just add, you know, follow the money. I mean, in, in this country, as Ralph knows very well, you know, NIH funds most of Northwestern and MIT. That's what we do. We love our students, but we're funded by mainly uh, government agencies, mainly NIH as well as other ones. Uh, and if they dictate that we have teams of scientists, you know, for, to get a big $20 million grant and we need to couple not just with our friends here in Northwestern at University of Chicago, but University of Illinois, Chicago and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and also maybe with DePaul or Loyola, you know, and spread the wealth into a range of different kinds of, of institutions, research one and others, you know, that's what you're going to do. But if the money allows you to stay in your own lab, you're going to stay in your own lab. But again, Professor you know, Ruff knows much more about this than I do because he's the great scientist and I'm just a social scientist. Thank you very much. Um, right. So um, I think there are uh, many questions on the COVID-19 issue uh, still. So um, from Iminu and Anthony Tran, and Jiuk Byun as well. So maybe, um, is there Minu Lee? I think you asked the, the question for the first time. Minu? Can you hear me? Right, okay. Could you briefly <clears throat> introduce yourself, yourself and ask the question? All right, thank you very much. My name is Minu Lee, and I'm an undergraduate in KAIST, majoring in material science and engineering. I have no choice but to be pleased to participate in this summit. Let me ask you some questions. How has COVID-19 impacted your own specific research or lives? Could there be some negative consequence of adjusting one's research to the current trend or need of society? Thank you. Maybe, uh... Well, uh, great question, Mino. As uh, President uh, Rife already mentioned, there are two kinds of research. One is intuition-driven basic research, and the other is technology-oriented applied research. Both are equally important. The development of nanomasks, for instance, is a kind of applied research. 
But we need basic research to discover the high-quality nanomaterials utilized for nanomask. Vaccines are being developed through translational applied research, but we need long-term basic research to understand the virus itself and virus RNA interaction mechanism. So I'd like to point out that basic research and applied research are complementary with each other and closely related. Without basic research, you can make technology breakthroughs. Likewise, without applied research, you can turn basic research outcome into actual products. A good example is a smartphone, the fruit of the most advanced science and technology in the 21st century. The smartphone could not be realized without basic research in the fields such as quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, signal processing, and AI algorithm. In general, basic research takes much longer and costs much more to achieve outcome than applied research. Therefore, research portfolios with basic research and applied research are very important issues for the national R&D investment policy. In the case of our country, Korea, the government is focused mainly on applied research until the 1990s. From year 2000, the Korean government has increased R&D investment in basic research since it realized that basic research is critical to becoming a leading country in science and technology. So, in conclusion, basic research and applied research are equally important and complementary with each other. Both types of research should be aligned with the development of a national science and technology policy. I hope this is a good enough answer for you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's quite challenging to, to review all the comments and questions, very interesting questions, and uh, juggling um, the many things uh, at the same time. And we have another a very interesting question from Martin Ziegler. Um, are you <coughs> here? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for uh, your question. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Yes, so with the advent of artificial intelligence... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so with the advent of artificial intelligence also come new weapon technology like autonomous weapons and uh, these uh, robots from Boston Institute of, uh, what's it, Boston Dynamics. And uh, to conquer the uh, uh, dangers of uh, misuse of uh, technology, several universities in Germany and Japan have uh, declared to refrain from conducting and participating in military-related research, uh, have signed the so-called civil clause. And I was wondering, now that we have here four university presidents, have your universities signed civil clauses? Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, um, does anybody uh, want to um, respond to the question? Well, I can comment very, very quickly. I think uh, uh, there is, there is uh, at least at MIT, there is a great deal of research in, in, in that space of, of AI for different applications. Uh, but on campus, we're not doing anything dealing with any, any military. Uh, so, so this is not something that applies to us. Mm -hmm. But I would not be able to comment about nationwide uh, other universities. Uh, I assume that, that different, different commitments are being made by very many American institutions. Uh, but I don't really know. So I can tell you at MIT, we don't do any military work on campus at all. Yeah, I think a very uh, uh, good clarification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, um, I have the same you know, it's opinion with um, the President Rife. And I think the ethical is, issue is very important in the development of AI. So definitely, as I mentioned in the pre previous panel discussions, we have to be very careful and, you know, to, uh, to get from and, uh, you know, killer robots such as killer robot. So 
Uh, we, uh, that's why I emphasize ethical education is very important for our you know, students and next generation you know, people. That's great uh, uh, confirmation and uh, gratification. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, so um, before uh, we end up the Q&A session, um, um, I'd like to just ask a personal uh, the question of my own. Uh, um, I believe university president is a role of very unique uh, challenges and given this importance to balance public engagement and research promotion and fundraising and sometimes even you know, political decision making. So I want to ask what is your most uh, memorable moment as president of your university? Um, maybe President Shapiro <laughs> and President Rife because you've been a, a president for <coughs> very long time so and you talked about kind of um, how you learn from your own failure, uh, Mr. Shapiro, but um, could you, uh, I'd like to ask you kind of your insights on that. Here I am, Mr. Techie. I, I'm now on, I think. Sorry about that. Um, you know, Matt, you just, the fact that you've done something for a long time, I've been a president for 22 years, doesn't mean I've yet gotten the hang of it. I just said teaching for 42 years, every class I try to be better than I've ever been. Every alumni event I try to be better. Every faculty meeting I try to run better. So you learn, you know, you just want to keep that humility and you, you want to surround yourself. This is leadership 101, if you will, with uh, people who are better at a lot of things than you are. It's pretty easy for me, honestly. So, you know, I'm not a scientist, but my vice president for research is a big time scientist. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in student affairs. I'm not an ex expert in, in computer technology. You know, so you surround yourselves with people who can fill in your many limitations. And uh, always try to remember, just as when we send our students off into the world, we remind them that their learning has only just begun. They have the tools to continue to educate themselves. They need the humility to remember that they need to educate themselves. And I think that's at least as true for a president as it is for an undergraduate. Thank you very much. Um, president Reif? Yeah, let me answer. I, I just offered two comments which are related to your question. I think to me, the most important thing that I've learned through the years is that we all as individuals, we have blind spots. And, uh, and the only way to make the right decisions or the best decisions is to make them with a group or listen to opinions from uh, different points of view, from individuals with different experiences and different backgrounds, because collectively you don't have blind spots, but as an individual you do. And, uh, and that, that to me is a very important um, uh, approach to, to decision making and to leading an institution, just, just collectively try not to have a blind spot. Uh, from the point of view of the best moment, uh, look, at the, the best moments for me every year, uh, the happiest moment, the one, the moment that I feel like what I'm doing is worthwhile is commencement. Uh, it's the best day of the year for, for MIT, for mm -hmm. actually probably for every university uh, to see the graduates uh, uh, ready for life, ready to leave the place and, and make their own they run uh, a mark on society uh, to, to see every year the 2,500 or so leaving the place, very well prepared to take on the world. Uh, that is just simply to me a, a very, very happy moment. On, on top of that, to see the parents of these students also smiling and happy. Of course, Comezu was online last year, so I didn't have that joy, but that to me is the best joyful uh, day of the year. Thank you very much. Also, President Masu. Yes, you thank share? you. Yeah, uh, I believe uh, as a president that is, uh, uh, it is important for highly specialized students uh, like you uh, to engage in, a, in dialogue with society uh, beyond your specialized field. So in our university, Tokyo Tech, from uh, 19, uh, 1946, just after the World War II, we have been focusing on liberal arts education under the, uh, under the uh, founding philosophy, be well educated and blossoms 
into speciality. Speciality. Uh, uh, spe speciality. So uh, recently, uh, from 2016, we reorganized our education system. So uh, students have to run uh, their special field more deeply, as well as they have to uh, run liberal arts from undergraduate to the PhD course. It is very important. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, I think uh, that's about all we have time for, um, you know, Q&A session. So thank you uh, to everyone who engaged our uh, dialogue uh, and asked the great questions. So finally, uh, shall we hear the closing remarks um, from uh, our uh, distinguished speakers? Um, okay, um, President Reif, uh, would you take the lead first? Yes, well, first of all, this is, uh, uh, I was looking forward for this evening and, and or this morning for, uh, for, 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 for those of you in, in Korea and Japan. Uh, Thank you. But this, this uh, event exceeded my expectations. I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I learned a great deal. I, I really, truly enjoyed listening to Professor Shapiro, and President Shapiro, and President Maso, and President Shin, your speeches and your comments. Uh, I, I, it was, it's a very, very, very good moment for me. I want to thank you, uh, President Shin, for the invitation and for allowing me to be part of this wonderful celebration. Thank you, Professor Park, for moderating. And uh, all I can say right now is that I wish we stay in touch. And I'm going to be following now that I know the presidents of uh, uh, three of the best universities in the world, uh, besides, 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 hopefully I might be one of them, for uh, I want to just watch how our institutions all progress and adapt to the changes uh, uh, that, that post the post-COVID, the new normal is going to impose on us. And let me just finish by saying what I said at the very beginning. Happy 50th anniversary, Kaist. Uh, there is a great, bright future ahead of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, President Masu, over to you. Yes. Uh, Again, a congratulations on the uh, 50th anniversary of KAIST. And thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, KAIST summit. And I want to thank to all uh, present, uh, Rafael, uh, Shafiro, Sin, and uh, Professor Park, uh, the nice uh, uh, Park son. And finally, I want to say thanks to all participants, maybe uh, all, uh, many of you are the students. Students is very important and you can communicate through this Zoom or webinar uh, with the students all over the world. Okay, please enjoy your uh, student life in KAIST. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, President Shapiro. Well, I can't really improve on what my colleague said so brilliantly. So I would just conclude by saying that, uh, you know, these are tough times. They're tough times for us as presidents. They're tough times for us as parents and spouses and children. You know, it's just, it's just all the challenges grappling with inequality and COVID and all that. So you have to find your inspiration wherever you can. And I found tonight to be extraordinarily inspiring, and I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, President Shin? Well, uh, you know, due to the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, we are witnessing an epochal event that is affecting the entire world. So far, more than 2 million people have lost their lives. A single virus is upending our daily lives. The world will never be the same after pandemic. It will redefine the new world order and new governing norms. Every country is scrambling to deal with this crisis that has touched every aspect of our lives. Researchers are racing to develop vaccines, and universities are doubling down on their efforts to utilize online education. Even though we are living in a time full of disruptions and uncertainties, we can view this as a new opportunity to improve our quality of life and reveal the world. This pandemic reminds us how we are closely connected. 
creative collaboration among the private and public sectors, along with the research universities from the around the world, will help shore up global resilience against the pandemic. We should work together to build a world of growing prosperity. The one thing for sure is that only the advancement of science and technology will deliver us from this crisis. Only medical breakthroughs can help us regain our high quality of life. We all know that unwavering innovations in the research sectors and global collaboration will realize these breakthroughs. Challenges will continue to confront us. However, we'll overcome them if we respond with the efficient and transparent policies that are fully supported by innovative science and technology. How to improve life quality and benefit humanity are long-standing research topics that KAIST is pursuing. In the years to come, KAIST will move forward to address global issues with global partners like you to benefit all of humanity. I sincerely hope to closely collaborate between our university and your universities in the summit to overcome the global crisis and to contribute to the happiness and prosperity of humanity. Thank you once again to President Ripe, President Masu, and President Sapiro for your wonderful presentation and inspiring discussion. I wish you all safe and healthy in the pandemic until we meet together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank, Thank you, very you so much. much. Yeah, it's been very exciting. Uh, discussion today. Um, thank you all um, for excellent questions and answers. Um, to all the speakers, thank you very much for your time and your excellent talks. Um, for um, President Shapiro and um, President Reif, um, it must be very late there. Uh, so um, have a good night there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. And also President Masu in Tokyo, uh, thank yes. you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and to President Song Chol Shin, uh, sincere uh, congratulations on your great achievement in and KAIST. Thank you very much for hosting this uh, great event. Thank you so much for your wonderful moderation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and also huge thanks uh, to the audience for watching this online discussion. We hope that all the participants have an uh, intellectual uh, takeaway from our uh, dialogues. Uh, if I may have an additional uh, 10 seconds, we'd like to thank Professor Kim Sang-gyu, John Chi-young, Lee Sang-ho, Hong sung bom and staff members uh, Kim Cheol-ran, Kim Cheol-run, Yoon Young-ran, Lee Yoon-jong, Jo Sang-mok, Lee myung sun Thank you very much for organizing this uh, great event. So now I'd like to conclude uh, this KAI Summit. Uh, 2021 uh, must be a year of reconciliation across all sectors, including education. So we hope to continue our discussion all together on today's very important questions of defining the roles of universities uh, in our future society. I'm Park kyung yeol from KAIST. I was really honored to be here and moderate this great session. Thank you very much for watching. Stay healthy. Thank you. <laughs>